everybody hear me properly? How about, how about the guys at the back? Um, so firstly, thank you for coming along. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I've never been to Bulgaria before, or Romania before, or Bucharest before. I'm in one of those three places. I'm not entirely sure where, but I'm here somewhere. I have, I, have, I have been seen in Europe before at least once. Um, so firstly, before we start off, has everybody registered at the back over there? Has everybody got their names in? Is there anybody who hasn't got their t-shirts as yet? You should, you should go and do that. Um, there's also some stickers at the back. Please feel free to help yourself. There's some stickers here as well. Feel free to help yourself. Um, so while that's, while that's going on, so one of the things that we like to do at the dojos is uh, basically have everybody introduce themselves. So what I'll do is I'll pass the other mic out, and we can start from here. There you go. If you, just, if you just tell us who you are and where you come from and what brings you to the dojo, then that's good. Maybe try holding it closer. Yeah. <laughs> Technology too complicated. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so my name is Adrian. I uh, came from Cluj. I work as a system engineer for an uh, outsourcing company. Cool. Sounds good. Do you want, do you want to pass the mic on and we can... Hey guys, my name is Danny, I'm a sysadmin and I have uh, kind of a little experience in CentOS and I came here to learn more about it. What do you normally use? Uh, Windows and Mac. Okay, <laughs> we, will, we will try and help save you. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Vasile, I'm from Cluj and uh, hi guys. <laughs> hi. Hi, my name is Lucian, I came also from Cluj, I work for Tripilla Global. Hi, my name is Marius. I came also from Cluj. I work for Free Pillar with these guys, and I hope I will learn many things here. Are you, are you, so, are you guys all sysadmins? Yes. Yeah. And you all use Windows? No. No, no okay. No. <laughs> no. Not at all. <laughs> my name is Bogdan. I'm from Bucharest, and I want to implement OpenStack from scratch. So, that's why I came here. My name is uh, Paolo Apostol and I'm from Hostway and hopefully I will present you something today, later. Uh, hi, my name is Marius, uh, also from Hostway, sysadmin and uh, I will present with Paul. Hope you like it. <laughs> cool. So I think let's, let's stop at that and then we can do everybody else sort of as the day goes along, right? Um, a couple of things that are on the screen at the moment. The, um, if anybody doesn't have the Wi-Fi access point, does anybody need Wi-Fi, then you can get it. It's the Tech Hub guest section. Uh, and SSID and the Tech Hub guest is the password for it. Uh, we have a hashtag, CentOS Dojo. Please feel free to uh, spam everybody you know throughout the whole day, please. Uh, and uh, there's a live stream that is running at the moment from the CentOS.org home. But at the end of the day. Okay, cool. Because we are expecting this week from US and from international people, so that's why we we have to use the CDN platform. Okay. It's a little bit difficult because the traffic is in the second box. Right. Okay. But we will get that today later. Cool. Also, once the sessions are over, then we'll get the videos, right? So we'll put the videos up on YouTube on the CentOS channel, so you can go back and you can carry on spamming all your friends about the cool stuff that they missed out. A uh, little bit of an introduction about me. Um, let me see if this works. Should do. There we go. Um, so my name is Karan Beer Singh. Uh, most people call me KB, including my dad. Um, uh, This, this came later. This wasn't there in 92. Um, 
said that there's this really cool thing that he had heard about called Linux, and you know we should try it out. So we saved up money for three months, and then he went out and bought, I think it was 65 1.44 MB floppy disks. Um, and then we had to find somebody who had a CD-ROM, which we didn't do. So we had to then drive, I think it was a three and a half hours to Delhi, because we'd heard of somebody who had a CD-ROM drive there that we could use to make images from. Um, thankfully, life has come uh, along quite nicely since then. Uh, and, and pretty much every year since 2008 has been the year of Linux on the desktop. And I think finally 2018 will probably be the year of Linux on the desktop. But in the meantime, we should keep trying, right? Um, I did development work for many years till 98, uh, 99. I was starting to do this thing called PHP. MySQL was, you know, something that people have started hearing about. Uh, things like Ingress and Unify and Oracle were, you know, things that you didn't really do anymore. Um, and I kept getting frustrated by the people who were doing sysadmin work for us. And I kept thinking, hey, these guys are crazy. I'm sure there's a better way to do this, right? Um, so in 2000, I switched over from being a developer to being an operations guy, infrastructure guy. Uh, and in 2003, I realized that no, there is really no better way. It is, it is pretty bad. Uh, the situation is, is quite grim in the operations world. Uh, so then I started doing this thing where we started writing code for operations work, which went on to become DevOps many years later. Um, at the time, it was, just, it was just code. We just did, you know, some of us knew development, some of us knew how to write programs, so we wrote programs. We didn't give it a name. Um, and then back in 2003, 2004, uh, I started doing something called, which went on to become called Big Data. This was 1,500 nodes of MySQL sharded across. Uh, and it was some really cool stuff. Again, it, it wasn't called Big Data then. It was just lots of data in lots of computers. Nowadays, you know, people like to call it Big Data and specialize in it. So that's kind of where I came from. And then 2004, 2005, I started doing infrastructure work for web companies, um, which is when I also discovered that uh, there's this thing called the CentOS project. And I wasn't one of the founders. I kind of joined them after they'd already done the first release. Uh, and just basically got my teeth in and started doing stuff. And, and here I am sort of, you know, 10 years down the road having done CentOS work. Is there anybody here who has specific questions about the project? Because I have a... I don't have very many slides. I'm just going to talk to you guys about general stuff uh, on and around the project. But if there's anything specific that anybody wants to know, then feel free to interrupt me. Feel free to raise your hand, whatever, and we can, we can talk about it in the middle. Don't wait to hold your questions back. Uh, but before I start off, are there any questions that people have about the project that you'd like to find out about? I can see one, sorry, Razwan, right? Razwan? Okay, so the question is how many developers and how are you organized in the core team? It's a good question. On slide number four, I'll answer that question. I think, yeah. That's another good question. On slide number six, I'll answer that question. <laughs> yes. So that's a very good question. Um, how long will we, what is the expected delay between Red Hat 7 and, well, not Red Hat 7. Red Hat 7 was released in, what, 2001? Uh, hopefully, yeah, it won't be 14 years. Um, RHEL 7 and CentOS uh, 7. Okay, so um, let, me, let me actually try and answer that question because that's not on my slides. I, did, I, I thought people had forgotten. I thought that was like, you know, you know we, can, we can all be friends again. So, how many people here know what CentOS is? Okay, so at, le at least four people do. So how many people here know the difference between the CentOS Linux distribution and the CentOS project? So at least two or three people. And I think these are all three people who've been in one of my previous talks, I guess. Okay, so I'll answer that question, but I'll answer that question in during the, during the talk. Is there anything else that people want to talk about? Any hopes, any aspirations, any you know key takeaways? No, okay. So, um, I've, I've already spoken about me. I do I do weird things. I do funky things. I work for a company at the moment that specializes in, or which exclusively does web operations. Um, and I think that's key to what I also do in CentOS is we bring a lot of that experience back in into the project. Um, so let me start off by talking about the CentOS Linux distribution, which is what I think most people seem to think of CentOS as being. Uh, the CentOS Linux distribution, right? Um, so this is based on sources that come through from 
Red Hat Enterprise Linux um, that they make available publicly, and then we rebuild uh, with the aim of creating a Linux distribution. Um, a lot of people also have this misconception of CentOS being a free rel. How many, how many people here seem to think of CentOS as being a free Nobody does. Well, a few people do. So, so we've got some really smart people here. Um, there are a couple of key issues that, seg that separate what Red Hat does and what we do. Um, the biggest one from that is that while we rebuild the sources, we don't rebuild the installers. So the installers for CentOS don't actually look anything like the installers do for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So if that's a big deal, then, then it's not really the same thing. The second thing which is also uh, doesn't actually exist as a product. There is no such thing called RHEL, like 5 or 6 or whatever. You, you can get a RHEL 6 baseline, and then you buy variants, right? You can buy like a cloud node, a compute node. You can buy, um, what, are the other, what are the other variants? Um, there's something about high scalable storage. Uh, then there's an HA module or whatever. So you can basically buy layered products, right? Which you don't with CentOS, you just get everything. Now, so that is, in that way, we're better off than them. But if that's a big deal, if you think that that's a key differentiator between what CentOS and RHEL does, then, then again, CentOS is not really like RHEL. And then the third big thing, of course, is that there is no support. You know, people have, even if you go to the CentOS IRC channels or if you go to the forums, they'll be like, hey, we don't support this and we only support what we ship and things. So, so my, my only message to all of those people is that we don't actually support anything. We publish the distribution. If you break it, excellent, fix it. Um, if you're nice, then please file a bug report. And if you're even nicer, then when you fix it, let us know what the fix was so we can fix it for everybody else as well. Right? So basically, you inherit the Linux distribution as, as something which you have to then own. Right? Um, <coughs> the key differentiator between the CentOS Linux distribution and the CentOS project is that the CentOS project is the, are the people, the resources, the infrastructure that goes into building the CentOS Linux distribution. Right? Does that kind of make sense? So. Um, there was a question on how we're organized. Um, we're organized in a very autocratic kind of a way um, where at one point we worked out who were the people who were most visible in the communities, who were the people who were doing most of the work behind the Linux distribution, and we invited them in to be a part of what is the CentOS core team or whatever, right? Um, they've been called the core team, they've been called the admin team, they've been called the CentOS team, the CentOS principals, there was, you know, the CentOS members came up at one point. But basically, it's about six people who do most of the infrastructure and the privileged work behind the scenes. Uh, and, I, and when I say privileged stuff, I mean things like they're the guys who have the root passwords for all the servers, right? They're the people who have access to the build systems, for example. Um, they're the people who know where the build systems are. We try and keep that a little private because we don't really want the whole world trying to break into those machines. Uh, and because there are only six or seven of us, or well, six of us, we don't really have the resources and the bandwidth to secure those machines. So what we do is the build systems are kept privately uh, in a setup where there is no internet connection from the build systems to the internet. And packages have to go in through a convoluted, you know, they have to go three hops in. Then when they come out, they have to go through certain tests. Uh, they go through the QA tests uh, before they can be made available publicly. Um, so apart from that, the second set of people who are actually the key people, the people who have the biggest say in what the distribution looks like is the CentOS QA team. I think we've got, we've got at least one member of the QA team looking you know, very angry that, you know, um, I think you all may know him as Wolfie in there. So, so basically, if anything is broken, if there's any problem that anybody has with CentOS, it's his fault. Um, the QA team is about 15 people, out of which um, about 10 to 11 are active at any given time. Um, and their role is primarily to make sure that we don't have any branding issue and we don't have any legal issues going through the distribution that we publish. Unlike most QA teams, because most people think of QA as being, hey, you know, here's a little bit of code, somebody compiles it, somebody else builds it, and then a third person, which is the QA team, is going to test that code to make sure it works. So we don't do that. Because what we hope to ship should be binary identical with what upstream is shipping. And how we assure you of that is by running a certain number of tests, right? So tests run privately, but the tests are available publicly. So what we say is that, hey, we think what we are shipping is pretty close to upstream, it's pretty close to what Red Hat is shipping, but don't trust us. Here are the tests, go away, run the test yourself, and then build your own trust, build your own level of trust. But when you do, make sure you blog about it, make sure you post about it, make sure you tweet about it so that everybody else can also kind of go in, like, like Hostway was to come through and Hostway was going to say, hey, we've run the tests and they look good and we've added five more tests. 
then people who otherwise trust Hostway can trust the fact that, hey, you know, there is at least one more entity who's run those tests. So what the QA team basically does is make sure that there is no uh, legal issue going through, that there's no Red Hat logos going through. There are no implications where a third party, like perhaps um, there's a company called XYZ, you know, based here in Bucharest, who goes to a customer and says, hey, I can give you free Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and here's the CD. If he does that, we want to make sure that what he gives that person is in CentOS. Does that make sense? Do you want me to quantify that a little bit? So, okay, there was a no, so I'll, I'll try and quantify. So what happens is that in certain packages, there are places where, um, for example, the man pages, right? It can say something like, man pages for the Red Hat Enterprise Linux distribution. Now, Red Hat does not require us by law or by their AUP to remove that Red Hat Enterprise Linux from there, but we remove it anyway. Because we don't want to be in a situation where a third party is able to say, hey, these are the man pages for the Red Hat Enterprise Linux distribution. Therefore, everything in the man pages applies perfectly to RHEL as well. What we really want to, the message we want to convey is that this is a package which corresponds to what we ship in CentOS, not what they ship in Red Hat. That makes sense? Yeah? Something small like um, when you look at GCC, right? And if you go GCC hyphen B, it'll tell you what GCC it is, right? And it'll give you 446 hyphen blah, 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 whatever. But it'll also say Red Hat GCC. Now, we leave that Red Hat in there because what we ship isn't GCC as the GCC project ships it. The GCC that we're shipping is the GCC that has been packaged and modified by Red Hat for their purposes, right? So we will leave that in. But if you go to something like, let's say, LibreOffice and you go to the help and about, over there, it also has the Red Hat, uh, I don't know if it does in Libre, it did in OpenOffice. It had uh, the Shadow Man, it had Red Hat's logo on it to say, hey, this is Red Hat's um, version of OpenOffice. So we actually removed that and replaced that with the CentOS logo to say, while this is patched by Red Hat, this is what you're running is CentOS Linux, not RHEL. Does, does that kind of clear up the thing? Right. Uh, so if anybody wants to talk about this, grab me later at any point and, uh, and we can have a chat about, about the details of, of what that's involved of what's involved over there. Um, so so that's, what the, that's the, what the primary mandate for the QA team is. What the QA team is also doing now is they're working on, well, they're working with me and True on things like the cloud images, which we're trying to push. Uh, they're working with us on um, things like, you know, we have, like, uh, Avanci does a lot of the work on the IPv6 side of things. So the QA team guys are actually in a position where they're now kind of moving into various other places, like helping us with the infrastructure stuff, helping us with the mirror admin, and things like that as well. Um, so again, a, a se separate group, then again from the core team, from the QA team, um, are the people whom we consider to be like the community champions, the people who do a lot of the work in the forums, people who do a lot of the work on the IRC channels, people who do a lot of the work on things like helping out on the bugs.centos.org site. Um, and again, it's, this is anybody who wants to kind of help out, can go in, can log in, create an account, and start helping out. And then, you know, if once you've done 40, 60, 120, 200, 300 posts, you know, you, you're welcome to be a part of that group. Um, and I think there are people who've now done um, about 15,000 posts or something. There's at least one person. Even on the mailing lists, we've got a couple of people who've got over a couple of thousand posts. That's not me having a heart attack, is it? No. Okay. Uh, so the CentOS project includes, you know, various groups of people who come together to do various things. In some cases, it is a group which is identified as a group. In many cases, it is just people doing stuff because this is stuff that they care about. Right? Like in any community, you will always have people who come along and who help other people out because this is something that they care about. You know, they might adopt one part of the system or they might adopt you know, some packages and just try and help other people out with those packages. The other part of the CentOS project, which is often overlooked, is the fact that we're the only large open source group which doesn't have any builds. As a group, as a project, as an effort, where we are running something like, you know, somebody said something like 40% of all Linux used on the internet is CentOS and something like 25% of all Linux used offline is CentOS. That's a, that, those are pretty big numbers. I don't know how to quantify it, so I, and I don't know if they haven't quantified, but those are numbers that have been floating around at various points, so you know, I trust them, they look good. They sound good when I tell people as well, so uh, I will keep those numbers. But we also as a project don't have any builds, and how we've been able to do that is by bringing in a very effective and a very efficient um, system of uh, donors. We've got donors who represent you know, universities, hosting companies, uh, hardware manufacturers, people who do networking stuff, data centers, people who otherwise benefit from CentOS coming together to help promote the project. Like, for example, we're here today. The CentOS project isn't actually inheriting any sort of bills to organize the stuff. This has all been organized by, uh, by the sponsors. By, uh, and yeah, so make sure you say thank you to everybody on your way out, I guess. Um, 
And all of these organizations are organizations which gain from having CentOS be present. So all of them have a vested interest in that they use CentOS internally as well, either as part of products or as a part of the work that they do internally. And therefore, it is in their interest to make sure CentOS exists. It is in their interest to make sure CentOS is still here two years from now, three years from now. And how they can do it is by helping things happen, like the dojos. If we need build systems, it's nice to be able to go to a large hardware com manufacturer and say, hey, you know, could you help us out? Could you get, give us a discount? Could you help us out, you know, maybe, or just give us a few machines or we need more memory. Um, the entire mirror network that we run um, is about, I think, 2,700 external mirrors. We don't, there are no builds involved in it, so we don't have to pay anybody to host that stuff. All of them run from external universities, companies, hosting companies, I think, are a, are a large chunk of it. Um, and I think we have about 120 odd machines which are a part of CentOS.org. And again, those are not machines that we bought. They're not machines that we pay for. Those are not machines we pay hosting for. They're all machines that have been donated to the project to use. Um, and I think as of May, uh, the numbers change on and off, right? Because hosters will come on, hosting companies will get bought out by other people, we'll lose machines, we'll gain machines. I think in May of this year, uh, at one point, we had 165 gigabits per second worth of network capacity of the CentOS.org infrastructure um, in a situation where we don't actually pay for any of these bills. Um, and that's a big deal. That's, I think sustenance for the project is, is a big deal, right? And to have a, a vendor network, have a sponsor network that comes together to make it happen is quite a big deal. And I don't think the project would be here, wouldn't be even you know, a, a, a percentage of what we've been able to achieve had it not been for these uh, hosters and for these vendors to come in. Um, I know we've got a couple of people here from hosting companies, right? How many people are here from hosting companies? We've, we've got, okay, five or six. So you guys know what I mean when I say that, you know, 100 gigabits per second, and we saturate this at release time. Have I? Ah, remind me there. Apologies. Um, I'm sure you guys understand that at release time, when we saturate these links, it's not a cheap network to be running. Um, and sometimes it's saturated for three, four, five days a month. Um, and then depending on who all are leaching and who all are doing on what they're doing, it could be you know, up to a week at a time. And if you do the numbers, that's a lot of traffic. 100 gigabits seeding out, let's say even for five days nonstop, is a lot of traffic going through. And the fact that we're in a position where we have no bills um, is, is a great place to be. So again, a, a thank you to all of the sponsors and the, and the vendors who make that happen. Um, the other part of the CentOS project is the developers. And, and this is a bit of a controversial subject when I touch on this, but CentOS doesn't really have developers as such, right? because all of the code that we ship out as a part of the Linux distribution comes from upstream, right? Effectively, what that means is all of the CentOS developers really work for Red Hat, and all of them have redhat.com email addresses, right? I, I let you guys think about that for a minute and how that kind of pans out. It's, it's a bit of a controversial thing because a lot of people say that, hey, Red Hat guys aren't doing this for CentOS, and that's fine. And I th but, but the point that I really try and make and the point that I try and stress is that you can see the commitment that Red Hat has towards open source by uh, actually creating a situation where it is possible for us to go away and be able to build a platform that other people can use, right? And in many cases, we don't build it for the big companies. Like, we don't really build it for the Facebooks and you know, the Instagrams or whoever else, the, the big companies who use CentOS. We're building it for the two-man, three-man, four-man companies who can't or who don't see a value proposition in what Red Hat is offering, but still want to use a platform that is RPM-driven, which can be managed in a stable, sane kind of a way, a platform where they know it's going to be supported for five to eight years, or not even 10 years, uh, a platform where they know they're going to get security updates in a, in a reasonable amount of time. So again, so Red Hat is a very big part of what we consider to be the CentOS project. I don't know if they see it like this. Um, maybe, so, but, but, so I'm not here to really speak on behalf of them or, or what Red Hat is doing, so, but if you do manage to speak to somebody from Red Hat, you guys must ask them that question, see how they feel about that. Um, so, so moving on from the project side, what happens is all of these resources within the project right, come together to build upon the CentOS ecosystem. Um, one short thing that is, that is very critical to the whole ecosystem is that we don't have developers, right? All of our developers have redhat.com email addresses. And that sounds good when I say it. It doesn't really mean very much. Um, the, whole, the whole point is the fact that you know, Red Hat is committed enough to pushing these sources out that we can then build into the Linux distribution. But what happens is, that the CentOS project builds a Linux distribution for the CentOS ecosystem. And it's important that we understand what the ecosystem is. The ecosystem is basically you guys, right? Um, the ecosystem is the CentOS communities. 
And these are CentOS communities, not driven by developers, not driven by features, not driven by technology, but by driven by users, by driven by problems that these users really have out in the world, right? Um, again, again, there's some of you who've been on the CentOS IRC channels or on the forums will know what I mean when I say that SE Linux is not, is not very popular with a lot of people. Um, a lot of documentation out there on the web, like if you just search for, hey, you know, how do I do this on CentOS? A lot of the documentation will start with step one, disable SE Linux. And you're like, oh, you know, you don't really need to disable it. But the effort that the users make, the effort that the community makes on the mailing lists, on the forums, on the IRC channels, even in comments that they post on blogs, towards making SE Linux a reality has meant things like, um, okay, and, and I can say this with authority, in 2008, we were in a situation where we received between two to three emails a day on security issues that people had on their CentOS machines. By just looking at how SE Linux adoption has gone up, by just looking at how the documentation on the CentOS wiki has improved, by just keeping an eye on how the forum feedback, the IRC feedback, the mailing list feedback has improved to create a more educated ecosystem. That's now gone down to a point where I haven't seen an email to the security list for maybe a week now. And most of them that come through are user support issues. Things like, hey, I'm trying to install CentOS and it breaks with a kernel panic, can you please help me? And it's like, this is not really a security problem, is it? Um, and, and all of that stuff is because of the fact that the ecosystem has evolved, you know, as people, who use CentOS have evolved. People who were using CentOS four years ago are now four years you know, more into the experience line, right? A lot of people who are here hopefully will take away some interesting things that they can go away and apply to their day jobs as well, hopefully in a better situation. And that's basically what the CentOS ecosystem is. The people, the communities, the user base, and the applications that people use on CentOS. You'll notice that, um, so some of you have been to previous dojos. I know at least one or two people who've been to previous dojos, but you'll notice that none of the talks are really about CentOS. Maybe mine is, but none of the other talks, none of the people who are talking about stuff are actually talking about you know, um, how they did a glibc patch to improve performance by 8% or whatever. There are some talks like that as well, but all of the talks, all of the user-facing content is always about applications. It's about how do you use CentOS to do some really cool stuff? How do you use CentOS in an environment that the users would want to be concerned about, right? And that's, that's key, that it's a user-specific focus rather than a developer-specific focus. Does that kind of make sense? So it's like, it's like if you look at Debian, or if you look at Fedora, for example, or you look at Gentoo, those are developer-led distributions. They're basically there to deliver new, you know, the craziest, the newest, the absolute bleeding edge features, which a lot of people need, right? But the CentOS ecosystem doesn't do that. We're not here to promote something that was released yesterday, or something that was released like 15 minutes ago. I'm not here to release, you know, packages that everybody should now start using. Most of the stuff that I would want to be talking about was released like two years ago, has been used for a year and a half. Everybody's found the bugs, all the security holes are gone. And then I can say, hey, this is now good to use in production or whatever, right? Does everybody kind of now get the CentOS Linux versus the CentOS project versus the CentOS ecosystem? Yeah, cool. Does anybody have questions at this point? There's two, okay. Let's, let's start on the left. So I don't work for Red Hat. I don't speak for Red Hat. Um, so I can only give you my guesses on something like this. Everybody who runs CentOS is somebody who's not running Debian. Everybody who runs CentOS is somebody who's not running Gentoo. Everybody who runs CentOS is, not, is somebody who doesn't run Windows. Right? Um, that's, 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 that's the easy answer. The more, the more complicated answer would be that because of where CentOS is today, it's uh, also easier for people doing some you know, weird stuff um, to be able to use. For example, uh, in the early Ruby on Rails days, CentOS was very popular as a platform because you could take CentOS, you could replace it with whatever Ruby you wanted, you could put your Ruby on Rails app on it, you could install the latest, greatest PostgreSQL on it, and you knew that apart from the three or four things that you care about, everything else is stable. Everything else is supported for eight years, so you don't have to worry about it, right? So. The reason why I started working with the CentOS project was, um, at the time I was working for an organization where we had, I think I mentioned, we had 1,500 nodes running a MySQL database. That MySQL was built with the Intel compiler. We were running Linux 2.2 with a very, very, very broken real-time patch. So when that organization spoke to Red Hat, Red Hat came back with a sales code which had way too many zeros on it, right? So we said, we'll just, we'll just take the risk and we'll just do it in-house because, and, and from, I understand Red Hat's proposition. Their proposition was, hey, if we need to hire three support engineers dedicated to your platform, that's gonna cost us money, right? If you want an eight-hour SLA, it can't be three, it has to be six. 
then you need a manager for the six. Then you have to cater for the one of those six guys going on holiday. Then what you guys are doing is very specific. None of our other customers do this. So we'll have to train our guys to work on your platform, right? Which means you'll have to give us space for our guys to come and sit in your office and work with you. And at that point, we were like, so why don't we just hire like two guys and just you know uh, take it from there? So it's a case of the value proposition. What we were doing worked for us. And how we were twisting it around was important to how we were able to use it. And I think that, that kind of feeds back as well, that you know, if you want to do something where perhaps Red Hat isn't very happy to support you, or perhaps you're doing something which is really crazy, you know, um, like you want to run CentOS on your phone or your watch, um, you know, because you want to be able to kickstart your watch every morning when you wake up in the morning, or you, know, you want um, to have you know, patches shipped by you know, Spacewalk or Satellite, and you want all your patches on your watch to be in sync with all your servers on you know, the center, then you know, CentOS is a good option. Nobody's going to stop you from doing that. What has also worked for CentOS is that in certain areas, um, there are, and this kind of leads into the ARM question as well, there are people who are working on hardware, there are people who are working on specific embedded solutions where they really want a distribution that they can use, they really want to use Linux, right? But they don't want to be using mainline kernels, they don't want to be using, um, let's say, you know, yesterday's build, or a build that's only supported for eight months or a year. They want something that they can build on, they can ship, and then support it out, you know, in, with the customers for three years, four years, five years. But they still want to run their own kernel. They still want to run maybe proprietary software on it or whatever. And they're able to do that with CentOS. Because as long as they don't ship it, as long as they're within the terms of GPL v2, they're fine to use CentOS as a platform. And that again works, I think, for in CentOS's behavior and, and for the benefit for everybody, really. Um, as far as Red Hat's equation, you'll have to have your credit card number ready and call 0800 Red Hat and have a chat with them. Right, so you had a question as well. Sorry, I can't. Yes. Um, so what, what really happened was that when the CentOS project came together, there was a group of people who were already having a conversation about having something like this uh, on the Chaos Linux project, right? Um, and it just so happened, circumstantially, that one particular person went out and booked the domain. Uh, he wasn't, so he did, he did some of the work originally, but he wasn't the only person doing any other work. I think people like True were around right since the beginning. People like Will Dinkel and, and Rocky were around. They were the guys doing most of the heavy lifting. Most of the work for like the Anaconda patches and stuff like that was done by, by these guys. Uh, but it just so happened that, that Lance had access and he was maintaining the domain. Um, not only for, I'm just going to move this, not only for the CentOS project, but for a bunch of other projects as well, but, and, and for a, you know, a whole bunch of other resources as well. And I think life just got in the way where you know, he had kids and he was doing other things and he had a business to run and that was running into a few issues. We got into a situation where we wanted to make DNS changes and it was taking four, five, six months before we could make those happen. Um, and then we tried to get in touch with him and that didn't work out. So then we basically had to kind of send an open letter out saying, you know, look, CentOS.org is, is a big deal. We'd really like to have access to this. As, as the project. Um, and that is when we created the core group, which we said you know, represents the interest of the project. And then we, we got the domain and he's moved on. So that is basically what the issue really was. And I think there's a lesson in there for every open source project, that when you start off, uh, plan for being a big project. Don't plan for being a 400 person project. I mean, like when I got involved with the project, I remember having a chat with Johnny Hughes, and, and both of us kind of got involved about the same time when CentOS 4 was about to come out. Uh, this is when we started doing stuff within the project rather than just using it. And I remember having this conversation with him, and we were like, you know, hey, this is fantastic. Like, if 100 people download this, this will be really cool, right? We'll have to have a massive party if 100 people download this. Uh, when we released 4.0, both of us were sitting on the uh, torrents. We had torrents running from home. And we were hitting, you know, reload, 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 reload to see, you know, how many people were downloading it. And I think between, within the first one hour, we were seeding at about 40 gigabits per second. And we tried to work out, you know, somebody somewhere has a lot of bandwidth. Right, <laughs> so there's no point in me running this on my 512 KB per second link. You know, I may as well turn the torrent off. And we found that kernel.org was seeding for this. Mirror service was seeding for this. Keynet was seeding for this. Um, how many? How many of you guys know these guys? Okay, so so these are the heavyweights, right? These are the guys. So with SourceForge was seeding the the CentOS torrent. These are like the heavyweights of open source content distribution in the world. Um, and we had, I think, something like uh, 18,000 people downloaded within the first week. And both of us were like, we are going to have to revise that 100 number at some point. And we were also very grateful that, again, it wasn't bandwidth that we were paying for. 
So I don't know if you guys realize that we don't actually ship ISOs from any of the CentOS machines. We only ship torrent files. And that's because we can't afford to have people downloading ISOs directly from us. That would just completely kill everybody. And it would be unfair to the donors who've given us those machines. You know, because a lot of the hosting companies will give us these machines and say, hey, okay, you can have a gigabit port, but I won't guarantee that at least half of that port is available to my data center alone, right? And there are data, there are hosting companies like, um, I know Pier One is one of them, where they've got tens of thousands of servers inside running CentOS, and they all just point those at the CentOS mirror, which is, which is internal. And they just save, like, he, and I was talking to one of the guys, and they were like, this is a no-brainer for us because the amount of money we save on transit is far greater than the cost of that one machine running on a gigabit port. So, so I, I got a little distracted, but does that kind of answer your uh, question? So basically, every open source project, when you're starting off, plan on being big. Plan on having a governance document. Plan on having some sort of a way to bring people into privileged situations. Also, very importantly, have a plan on how you're going to kick people out, including yourself. It always has to be you know, tangible. It always has to be that you know, if you've got five people, then three people should be able to vote on it. And you always have to have guidelines that, hey, if somebody's not around for more than four months, then his keys get removed. If he's still not around for another three months, then you know, his name goes away, and his keys get removed, and you know, he loses privileges or whatever. Always plan on doing that. We didn't. Um, over a period of time, we've tried to rectify that. Um, and I think the community has been quite supportive for that. Is there, is there anything else that people want to talk about? Okay. Yes. No, so the word compete doesn't come in anywhere in what we do. Um, as, as, as I'm sure you know, having been around with the CentOS project for a long time and keeping a track of what we're doing and you know being very critical at the suitable times, um, we don't actually have a marketing group. We don't have a promo team. Our promo team is restricted to three guys who get together to organize beers before FOSDEM in Belgium every year, and sometimes maybe one of the other events as well. So we don't really have a promo. We don't ha really have an evangelical team as it is. Um, and the message that we've tried to focus on, and I know we lose it every now and again because you always have fanboys who come in. Um, the message that we try and promote to everybody is that, hey, if you want to consider Linux, and if you're a business, and if the Red Hat proposition doesn't work for you, so when you go out to evaluate your options, consider CentOS as one of your options. So it's fine, hey, if, if there are people where Windows works for you, that's fine. There are places even today where Windows XP is the best possible solution that people can get, that's fine. You know, you can, you can, um, use whatever you want. But when you consider your options, we want CentOS to be one of the options you consider. And the reason why we want you to consider CentOS is not because of the distribution, but because of the ecosystem, because of the people, because of the momentum already in the project. So we don't really consider Debian to be, uh, a, 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 to a point where we actually share resources with Debian. Uh, last year, there was a problem early in the year where uh, there's this really cool technology, right, uh, called EFI or UEFI. How many people here have had the pleasure of meeting UEFI at some point? So a few people. So you all know what the excitement is about, right? It is, it is quite painful. Um, so we found ourselves in a position where we did not have a machine that had UEFI that we could use in gear. So we actually shipped 6.2, knowing that it, you cannot use it on a UEFI machine. So the proposition there was, do we delay till such time as we can reach out to somebody and find a machine, or do we ship it? And we shipped it. And two weeks later, we shipped a new installer called 6.2 minimal hyphen UEFI.ISO. Uh, with 6.3, we tried to fix it by, because we already had the resources in, and 6.4, of course, we've now got that machine plumbed into our regular test environment. So what this machine is, is that we went out and we spoke, to, or rather, I managed to corner um, one of the Intel uh, PhD guys, their professional services groups guys, uh, by saying, hey, look, you guys are doing the development work behind UEFI. Surely Linux is a big deal, right? And surely people who use CentOS are relevant to you. What can you do? to help us out. They were like, you know, this is, nobody asked us before. Where can we send the machines? So I was like, I don't really want it at home. Uh, let me ask around. And then the Oregon State University guys run something called the OSL, the Open, Sof open Solutions, uh, no, OSL, Open Systems Lab. Um, so we basically spoke to the OSL guys and said, look, could you host a machine? And they're like, yeah, fine. So now when they, when they brought the machine in, we realized that we only need it for, um, what we will probably quantify, maybe two weeks, three weeks in a year when we do release testing. Apart from that time, the machine is idle. So I went out and spoke to the Debian guys saying, hey, do you guys want a UEFI machine? And they're like, yo, this is fantastic. We don't have a UEFI machine. Where do we get one? And then I went and spoke to the Gen2 guys. 
And the Gen2 guys were like, you know, if it's a real problem, if the users really have a problem, they'll submit a patch. Uh, but when they went out and asked around, they found that the guy, I'm forgetting his name, I apologize, um, the guy who was doing the live CD things had actually set up a VMware environment where he was trying to emulate UEFI to do his testing. Very painfully, it used to take him six hours to go through an install process. And I was like, look, this is a machine sitting idle. Why don't you guys use it as well? So it's now being used by the Debian guys, and it's being used, I believe, by the Gen2 guys as well to do some of the UEFI testing. And we're quite happy to share resources like that. Um, we did something similar for with IBM on the PowerPC platform where Again, we, we were able to, I think Jeff Shelton and, and Lars Halberstam did a lot of the work at, at OSL, but we were involved as well from the center side saying that if IBM was to offer up some hardware, we will try and build a PowerPC platform as well. Uh, and there are something like six or seven machines at OSL, which we all timeshare, uh, or well, we share resources on, and that's been used by the Debian guys, it's been used by the Postgres group to do some of the testing, it's been used by the Apache Foundation for some of their stuff as well, and we're doing some of our building as well over there. So we're quite happy to share resources with, with everybody who wants to. Places where it's slightly harder to do is things like the mirror network. Because a lot of people who give us with those machines give it to us with the understanding that those resources will be used for the CentOS project. But so, so we don't really see ourselves as competing with any, any of the other Linux distributions as such, or with anybody really. It's like, you know, hey, use whatever fits for you. But when you do your evaluation, consider CentOS to be one of those, one of those options. Does that kind of answer your question? Right. So I'm going to try and quickly plow through this. Um, so, so my talk was meant to be about growing the ecosystem and about 40 minutes into the talk, we're actually at it. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do as of about a year and a half ago is that we realized that a lot of people who use CentOS don't use it because it's CentOS, they use it because it helps them solve a problem. Whether it is to run a MySQL database, whether it is to run WordPress, whether it is to run Ruby on Rails app, whether it's to run SMB services, you know, Samba, Mail, whatever. Um, but yet we don't really do very much around those particular areas. All of the focus that we have as a project has always been about the Linux distribution and about the user community, the ecosystem as it is. We don't really do a lot. We've had, I think, three or four packages and extras. Um, we've never really had a user contributed package available in. We've always said, hey, you know, if you want to contribute RPMs, go to Apple or go to RepoForge or you know, set up your own repo or whatever. And we're trying to solve that. We're trying to solve some of those problems now by reaching out to other repositories, by saying, you know, if what you're doing is used by a lot of people, then why don't you bring that content in? Because we have very good build systems now. Over the last five, six years, you know, I've bought something, other people have bought stuff, we've had machines given to us. Uh, our primary build service uh, runs off an Ecologic SAN, which has got 12 SSDs. Um, and we've got, uh, we've got 128 cores um, running off that. Um, I mean, if the debug stuff turned off and the testing stuff turned off, we can build a new kernel in 18 minutes, which is, which is a really good place to be. But then we only build a kernel once a week. Have I lost it again? I think I might need JP's help again on the, on the screen. Um, so what we really want to do is we want to make those resources available to other people to come in and be able to help us and grow the ecosystem um, around things that people care about, right? Um, I have a couple of examples of things that, that, uh, that we're working on and things that we have done already and things that we're working towards. Um, let's see. Soon. Um, one of the areas that I think we've failed as a project to do um, very well is that we failed initially in being able to consolidate the repositories um, around CentOS. And I know of, I personally know of more than 90 repositories that exist that people are running that target CentOS. And out of those 90 repositories, I'm assuming, I haven't tested, but I'm guessing a lot of the code is actually common. A lot of the stuff is common. So what would be really good to do is if we can build a resource that allows these 90 people to come together and build 90 different applications rather than building four applications in 90 different ways, right? Um, and a couple, of, um, um, a couple of things that I'll, I'll come to, the, I, I've mentioned on the user focus, right? The CentOS ecosystem is, is effectively user driven and that's a very important place to be. All of the stuff that we're trying to do, all of the stuff that we're trying to grow the CentOS project into, all of the areas that we think we want to address are all driven around what people are using CentOS for. So things like the hosting industry, things like HPC, things like the VoIP industry, things like virtualization in the cloud, things like, like ARM is, is, a, is, a big, is a big thing that we're working on as well. But it's all user focused, it's not developer driven. So if you've got the latest, greatest you know, um, replacement library or replacement language to PHP, then CentOS is not really the place to do it. You can also target CentOS, but there are other places which are more suited for, for what you're trying to do. Um, but if PHP 5.4 is what everybody wants to use, then perhaps you should help 
us build a PHP 5.4 platform that you know users can use and help us maintain it. Let's see. Um, okay, so how does how does that actually work? The important thing is come together as a group or as an individual to find something that you deeply care about, and then try and solve problems which are specific to that particular domain. So it's like you know it's sometimes it's it's very cool to say hey I manage like 500 RPMs. But the problem is that you probably manage 500 RPMs really badly. If you only had four, you can probably do a better job. You can have more responsibility. You can probably help the users do a lot more. So ideally, find one or two things that you deeply care about, whatever they may be, whether it's PHP 5.4, if it's Apache 2.4, if it's you know the latest version of MariaDB or MySQL or whatever. Find one or two things that you deeply care about. Find what the problem is, right? And then propose a solution, ideally, or at least propose what the problem is on one of the you know community channels, like maybe. I would probably say uh, the CentOS Devel mailing list is the best place to bring that to, right? Send an email, say, hey, I'm, you know, introduce yourself. Say how and why you've been involved with CentOS. I've been using it for three years, four years, five years. This is what I do with it. And I think there is a problem that the latest version of MySQL, for example, is not available. And I would like to help solve that problem, right? And then somebody from the project will help you get access to the build services, will help you get access to all of the resources that you need to be able to push that, that package, right? It could be a collection of packages like we'll, we'll come up to. Um, so one of the things that we've done and shipped, is, which is a good example to work on, is the Zen for CentOS project. How many people here use, use Zen? So a few people, a few people. Um, how many of you use KVM? Not a lot. So what, does, so what sort of virtualization technology does everybody else use? Are you guys all using VMware? OpenVC? Is anybody using Hyper-V? Is anybody, there are a couple of people. Uh, okay, so so that's good. So um, one of the things that happened with CentOS 5 was CentOS 5 was the first really easily accessible distribution which had a virtualization pro platform that anybody could use, right? And it was Zen. So a lot of people invested a lot of effort using Zen. A lot of people invested a lot of time building script and automation around Zen. And when CentOS 6 came out, there was no Zen DOM 0 support, which wasn't really at that time a big deal because you could still run CentOS 5 as your DOM 0, as your host and you could run CentOS 6 as VMs inside that. But when people started using this stuff, using, started using these things, they realized that, hey, on a typical Dell platform, the CentOS 6 kernel is 8 to 11% more efficient on power consumption and on CPU uh, utilization than CentOS 5 was. And if you've got 100, 200 machines, then 10% is a big deal, right? So the problem that came through, and this was very, very vocal at that time, was, hey, we need to get a newer kernel that can run with CentOS 6 that can run with the tools around CentOS 6 that we can use to host Zen. And uh, we came together as a group, and we had a couple of companies like, like GoDaddy and Rackspace uh, pitched in as well, Citrix pitched in, the Zen upstream guys pitched in, and we built, we built and curated a, a, a Linux 3.4 kernel, which works on CentOS 6, which is usable for other things as well. And we've now delivered a complete Zen for CentOS stack, which has, uh, I think, about 20 or 1,000 unique IPs hitting the repository, so at least about 20,000 users using it. I think that's a, that's a great example of how we were able to find a problem grow the ecosystem, grow the CentOS project to a point where it solves that problem, and people are now able to, to use what's coming through. Um, the other thing that's also important, uh, I'm aware of the time, so let me just browse through these. The other, one of the other things that's important is that the CentOS cloud strategy, we never really had a cloud strategy, but the closest thing that we had to a cloud strategy was that we weren't really concerned with what instances people are running. But when people were building the clouds, we wanted them to consider CentOS as the host platform. We were like, hey, if you're going to go out and build a 300 node um, public cloud or a private cloud or whatever, you know, that's fine. Think about Ubuntu. If you're thinking about Open OpenStack, you're thinking about Eucalyptus, you probably have CentOS anyway. If you're thinking of Open Nebula, if you're thinking about CloudStack, you know, whatever. You use whatever you want. But when you do your evaluation, think of CentOS as an option for your DOM0, for your host machines. And you run whatever. Run Windows in it if you want. Run uh, Ubuntu, Fedora, whatever you want in the, in the instances. And that worked for a long time to a point where I think uh, without going into names, um, I think a lot of the big public clouds at the moment actually run CentOS on, on the host machines. A lot of big infrastructure entities run CentOS on, for example, the storage networks or for the software-defined at the SDNs. A lot of them are based off CentOS. And, and you know they do simple things like maybe run their own kernel, maybe run their own little hypervisor, whatever. But they're still running CentOS as the base. In the last six months, we've now tried to switch that across to a point where we're saying, hey, um, now that you've got CentOS on your host machine, why don't you think about CentOS in your instances as well? And what we're trying to get to is we've now published official CentOS images on AWS. So 
through the marketplace stuff. I don't know if, if you guys use AWS, but if you do, then you can probably see those. Um, we are working with Rackspace. We're working with um, a lot of the other big uh, guys as well. We're working with the HP Cloud guys as well. We're working with the Google Computer Engine guys to actually to have official CentOS images available within those ecosystems. And what we're also doing, what, what Drew is predominantly doing, is that we're looking to ship images ready for consumption within things like OpenStack, things like CloudStack, Open Nebula, you know, pre-contextualized, pre set up with CloudNet or whatever images, and we build those the same day that we build the Linux distribution ISOs. So it's like when we release 6.4 or when we release 6.5, we will release 6.5 ISOs at the same time as the images are available in AWS and HP's cloud and Rackspace and Google's computer engine and on a couple of other people. I, because I don't think I'm actually at liberty to say who the other people are. Um, and also ship images that you can use. So if you're running Eucalyptus or Open Stitch, OpenStack with OpenSwitch um, or Open Nebula on your premises, you'll have images you can download to use straight away at that time. Uh, Cloud.centos.org. But the actual releases will be mentioned in the release notes. So at the moment, we only mention ISOs and MD5s and SHA sums for the ISOs. We'll actually also include details for all of these images. Um, ARM came up as a, as a question a while ago. Um, and we've tried ha a couple of times to get an ARM platform going. And I know a couple of independent people have tried to get ARM going with CentOS as well. Uh, the, the key challenge there is that CentOS 6 is now fairly old code. It's about two to three years old as a, as a, ba as a baseline. ARM is very new. A lot of the really cool features like hot load um, only went into GCC 4.7. Uh, a lot of the work that the Linaro guys are doing with ARM is again based on their own sort of you know Debian derivative that they try and curate a little bit. Um, so the challenge that we have is do we try and backport all of those things to CentOS 6, which is really hard and needs a lot of effort and it needs a lot of people. Um, if, if half of you guys want to start doing this on Saturdays and Sundays, then that would be fantastic. Uh, but it's been really hard finding people who have the level of knowledge who can, who can actually help and do this sort of stuff. So what we've now started doing is we've now started trying to get ARM hardware in. We're trying to now get a couple of people. We've got Calcida who've offered to help us out. I think most people who know ARM will probably know Calcida as well. Um, they're the biggest sort of the big vendor at the moment who are doing the system on chip, which a lot of the other guys like Penguin Computing and Boston resell. Um, and what we've also done is we've got a group together, including Penguin Computing and, and Boston Interworks and a couple of other guys as well. Um, and what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and put together enough knowledge we're going to try and put together enough tool chains in place so that when RHEL 7 comes out and when we start rebuilding CentOS 7, we're at a point where we can actually do an ARM on 7. What we might do in the meantime is have like a bastardized version of CentOS 6, maybe a CentOS 6 which runs a 3.10 kernel built with GCC 4.7 using glibc maybe 2.18 or whatever. So this won't really be CentOS and we don't really want to call it CentOS. <laughs> Oops. Um, but we, we want to do something like this as a prep for when 7 comes around. So that when 7 comes around, um, we're not struggling to then find hardware. We're not struggling to find the tooling. We're not struggling to find the people to kind of do that. Does that, is that, does that kind of make sense? Um, and if anybody who's interested in ARM, please send me an email, and I'd love to get you guys involved. Because there is stuff happening at the moment. There's hardware available to anybody who wants access to it. Uh, and there are some very interesting threads going on. Unfortunately, some of them are happening on private email. Some of them are happening on ARM-specific dev lists. Some of them are happening in various places, you know, some of the vendor specific lists. We'll try and bring all of those to the CentOS lists. And it'll really help if, you know, we can get maybe 15, 20 people together and say, hey, if you're interested in ARM, we'd like to get an ARM effort out, but we'd like to do it within the CentOS ecosystem rather than doing it somewhere else. So that's, that's where we are with the, with the ARM side of things. Um, PowerPC is something that I touched on, that we've now got access to hardware. Um, and again, a lot of universities in the US especially came back and said, hey, you know, we have PowerPC hardware. How do we? you know, get CentOS going. So we are now actually working on, on getting this going. Again, for 6.5, we should have it released. We might actually have a beta version before 6.5 comes around as well. Um, I guess there are a lot of people here who work in hosting, so you guys will be interested in this. One of the efforts that is kicking off now, as in, in the last week or so, is uh, a couple of people, six people, have got together to produce something called a high-performance LAMP stack, um, which is going to be based on PHP 5.4. It's going to be based on some derivative of MySQL. We're not using MySQL there. Um, the Percona guys are quite keen on us using a Percona server. We're working with them to do so. If we are not able to do that, then we'll probably go down a MariaDB route. We're also going to ship a high-performance web-specific um, kernel, which has all of the syscontrol stuff already predefined. We're also going to get an Apache 2.4 stack in. We're going to get things like uh, MPM ITK. We're going to get stuff like um, FCGI. So a complete stack that you can use, but off components, which are otherwise not included in the distribution. 
Um, and this is primarily being curated by uh, Mike McLean out of uh, GoDaddy. I think they use it in their uh, high performance uh, clusters as well. Um, and and they're, they're, they're willing to kind of you know, run the whole project and they, sh they should be an announcement about this fairly soon. Maybe at the next dojo there'll be some demos as well. We've done some testing privately on a, on a Dell server that I own in, in the UK and we found between 218 to 240% improvement in the rate of content delivery. So this is not number of pages, but it's the rate at which a page finishes executing. Does that make sense? So it's actually the throughput, not the number of pages that you're measuring, um, which, is, which is a good place to be. Right. So these are uh, a couple of the uh, examples there. Come join the effort, find a problem domain. If any of these is interesting to you, come join the effort. There's a mailing list there. Some of you who've got superhuman vision can probably read the thing. It's, it's sent us Devel well, uh, as a mailing list. Um, so come join the effort, and uh, you'd be welcome to, to be a part of that. Is there anything specific, anything that anybody wants to talk about? We've got literally one minute. Have we, have we answered all of the questions that had come up at various points? It's a great problem domain. Come make that happen. There should be an announcement going out sort of in the next week um, with resources. But the best place to actually hang on and to find out what's happening with this at the moment is to join the CentOS weekly sync up meetings um, from the 11th of September onwards. So every week at 4 p.m. UTC on a Wednesday, we have a sync up on IRC, on the CentOS Devel channel, where a lot of people who, uh, who are involved with the various efforts will come together and talk about specific things. And we're gonna try and get the LAMP stuff uh, in, into that particular channel initially. And then we'll try and get, once we've got packages up, then we'll try and get stuff up onto GitHub and we'll try and get uh, RPMs into dev.centos.org as well. UTC. Yeah, sh absolutely, why not? Um, the actual effort, the scope of the effort, and I don't really want to sort of do the announcement right now, um, is to include a complete ecosystem. So it'll include things like graphite and carbon for monitoring uh, and for performance tuning and things like that. It'll include some scripts that have predefined setups, like if you've got a machine with eight gigs of RAM, then how you configure your MySQL setup is different from how you configure it if you've got 128 gigs of RAM. If you've got two cores, you configure it differently to if you've got 128 cores, for example. Um, one of the guys who's a part of this effort is responsible for running MySQL on five nodes. So we thought, hey, you know, five, uh, I, you know, I've, I've run MySQL on five nodes. But then he told us what those nodes were, right? 128 cores and about two terabytes of RAM on each core, on each, on each node, sorry, um, backed with something like 150 SSDs on an InfiniBand network. So we, we would love to have your config files for MySQL available. Uh, just in case there is somebody else who also has the same problem. Um, but, but in terms of scope of what we do, it's, it's you know, once the, once the code is available, or even as we start doing the alpha beta build, if you want to come along and say, hey, I'm happy to build an AWS image, then all you have to do is submit a kickstart. We already do, we already have automated provisioning in place for this. you'll have to ask Red Hat. So the question was whether there'll be system D, right, at GNOME 3. You'll have to ask Red Hat about that. I would have no idea what's in Bell 7. Some people think it's probably going to be there. But, but I think the only people who can authoritatively answer that is, is Red Hat. I think if you look at the Red Hat Summit documentation, the slides and things like that that people posted, uh, I think I think the only people who can really answer that question is, is Red Hat, right? Um, but again, if if they ship System D and if you think you can help maintain like a different version, like an upstart or or, or you know even the Sys5 stuff, then you're most welcome to come be a part of the project and just run a completely parallel thread. Um, and the the environment, I mean, the the point of the whole thing is that the environment, the build system resources are all available for people to come and do things like this. 
Right, so I don't really, uh, okay, let's just do one more question. No, so that was the Zen for CentOS project that you were talking about, right? So there's a 3.4 based kernel, um, which a couple of people came together and built, and that's not from Red Hat at all. That's that's a that's a good example of how we did something outside what Red Hat does to extend the system. So at the moment, the kernel is actually maintained by the z by help from the Zen project itself, uh, and that includes kernel engineers from Citrix and from other companies as well. Um, and we know that that Zen for CentOS stack is being used internally at Rackspace and at GoDaddy, at least. Uh, those are the two companies I know I can talk about, and I know there's at least another 10 or 15 big, big, big entities who run massive clouds on the Zen for CentOS stack. So just because of that, I think there's a good, there's a good possibility that that will be maintained going into the future as well. Cool, so thanks guys, thank you for your time. Um, let me. So let's just take a quick five minute stretch of legs and uh, JP is going to then tell you everything you ever wanted to know about DNS servers on CentOS. Some things you didn't want to note as well. <laughs>